Well, welcome back, everyone. I'm uh, Jim Best, and uh, I'm uh, really honoured to be speaking and chairing this next session. Uh, there, there are just so many memories that uh, come back of not just of Karen, but of all uh, other former colleagues who, who are here. Uh, I was asked to start off with uh, a slide that uh, gives apologies. I'm not going to read out all the names. Uh, I think uh, Terry Nolan's already been mentioned. And uh, Greg Collier, who's not on this list, also wanted uh, to particularly to send his apologies, Karen. So, um, so many stories. Oh, thanks. Is that the first slide? No, you skipped one. I skipped one. Oh, right. Thanks. OK. So, so um, I was trying to work out the chronology and just totally failed because Karen has just made too, too many moves. <laughs> uh, I don't, don't know anyone else. Saint Jack Martin, or Jack Martin was saying earlier, uh, we don't know anyone in academia who has made so many moves and has been as successful as we've heard everywhere that you've been, Karen. And uh, I, th I think uh, the number of people who are here from all around Australia, and I did fly from Singapore just to be here for this event uh, because you have been such a wonderful colleague and, and friend over the years. Um, I, my first memory of you, I, th I think, was you know when you were at uh, the Royal Melbourne in the Department of Medicine. Heard you've been just about in every department of medicine in, in Victoria, uh, at least. Um, and uh, you know, I, my memories are of very vibrant, outgoing maybe loud person <laughs> um, and, and uh, I was being reminded earlier of one of my uh, medical school one of my medical school classmates that you acted as a demonstrator and people remembered you because you wore boots very prominent boots <laughs> so I think Karen has always been always been distinctive and a number of references to the glasses, but they're just, just part of your distinctiveness. So uh, the, the little story that I actually want to tell about Karen was our trip to uh, Darnley Island. And that was, look, I, as I say, I just can't remember the chronology, but uh, Karen was invited to, um, uh, visit Darnley Island, uh, also known as, you can see that it's Erub Island, it's way up near Papua New Guinea, it's sort of on the, near the top, <coughs> top right, yep. And uh, the community invited Karen, and this, I, I, I think, tells of how widely regard, regarded and respected Karen is <laughs> in the Indigenous communities of Australia, and, and that's uh, the case why so many representatives of the, of the, of the Australian uh, Indigenous community are uh, present today. This was the Torres Strait Islander community, of course, and I, I think we flew up to Cairns, and then we got on a little plane like that, and, it, and the pilot took off into a thunderstorm, that's, that's the picture below. Uh, we could see nothing for about the first five minutes, except <laughs> could see absolutely nothing for five minutes. And then suddenly we came out through the uh, storm and had this amazing view as we flew right up the whole length of the barrier reef. I started to get a bit worried because the pilot had really quite serious central obesity. And I was thinking, what happens? <laughs> what happens? Because I was sitting up the front with the pilot. 
and I, I was noticing this and thinking, what, what happens if this guy has a, a heart, suddenly has a heart attack there? <laughs> so every well, the plane's got two engines, but he's uh, only got one heart. So anyway, uh, was that we were distracted by looking at the amazing view of the, the whole of the barrier reef. Uh, and then we approached Darnley Island and saw this landing strip there. <laughs> and it's on a slope so that you land uphill and you take off downhill. <laughs> it, but it, it, we got there, we got there got there safely and then started a week of very hard work for Karen. I, I think I, I recall the picture on the right, top right, is of the palm trees. And that, my main worry for the week was not to get hit on the head by a coconut <laughs> <laughs> because it is, it's a major cause of serious injury and death. Uh, Karen absolutely got straight into it and had uh, everybody lined up and worked incredibly hard and it, it it reminded me of Karen's boundless energy and enthusiasm and her incre incredible way of engaging with the local community and when I was putting together the, these slides uh, I recall that Karen's way of interacting with the Indigenous community is based on an incredible level of respect. Uh, it's based on uh, a deep understanding of the culture and the history, and it's built on very personal relationships. So that Karen, uh, I think, I don't, I've never seen Karen take a backward step, and if there was a disagreement, she would disagree, but in a respectful way. Uh, and I think her, her approach, her forthrightness, was also greatly appreciated on this occasion in Darnley Island. Um, and the only other thing I was going to mention is that we, it, it was an incredible experience. Also, we had a hungi uh, with uh, some giant turtle meat. And I actually had the privilege, being a male, of being given some of the turtle fat, <laughs> which <laughs> I'm not sure whether it probably was monounsaturated, but <laughs> I, I can tell you it was quite an effort. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't so sure that was a privilege. Uh, but but it, it, it's a, a great memory for me and I had a, a wonderful week and I learned so much uh, from Karen uh, during, during that adventure. Now the other um, point I want to make is that through Karen I've met an amazing number of women. I mean it's, it, it's no coincidence of the speakers, there are 19 speakers on this program, 13 are women and six are men. And, you know, during, Karen has been an inspirational role model to everyone, including me, but she has uh, associated herself with, I'd say, other strong, very capable women, and she has been an, also an inspiration to as you know, as we've heard today from a number of the speakers, uh, an inspiration to so many people. Um, that's Wendy Hoy on the top left, and I, I, I don't think Wendy has ever taken a backward step either. <laughs> but uh, Karen and Wendy, you know, have done fantastic things together and worked, worked together extremely well. And one of my sort of great experiences was to be on a program grant as a principal investigator on a program grant with both uh, Karen and uh, Wendy. Now, I published quite a lot with Karen. These are, you know, some of the papers. They're all related to Indigenous health. And it was through this work with Karen also that I had the privilege of working with Indigenous communities and 
learning a lot, a lot about the culture and, and the history of uh, the Indigenous peoples of Australia. You'll see that each of these papers also have Kevin Rowley as a co-author, and uh, uh, Robin mentioned uh, him before, but I also want to mention Kevin because uh, I had also the privilege of working with Kevin, and in quite a different way, in his own way, he related uh, so um, extremely well to uh, Indigenous communities throughout Australia and, and was, res was highly regarded and respected by in Indigenous communities. And as, as Karen used to say, you know, you'd think he came from the outback of <laughs> somewhere in the, the far outback of Australia, you know, with his mannerisms, his boots, and, and, and his easy way of engaging. But uh, in fact, he came from Reservoir. 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 There is a reservoir boy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, Karen and I worked very closely together uh, in the Department of Medicine at St Vincent's. I saw in the the, the sort of preamble uh, listed some of the places Karen had been. I think they ran out of space, but Karen was at St Vincent's twice in the Department of Medicine, and was a, a, a fantastic. Uh, su support to me as head of department, um, a great confidant. We uh, enjoyed on many occasions uh, talking, complaining about the management at the University of Melbourne. I, I don't think either of us have been particularly good in our careers at managing up. I'm, try I'm trying to do better now in Singapore because <laughs> it's very, very important to manage up in Singapore. Uh, in Australia, it's not so critical. You can get away with it. And I think Karen, both of us prob probably did and we enjoyed uh, sharing our, um, as I say, uh, our critiques of management, uh, particularly at the University of Melbourne. Uh, apart from the program grant that we sh shared, we shared a Centre for Clinical Research Excellence, many publications, and it, it was a fantastic era for the Department of Medicine at St Vincent Senn because we had uh, fantastic people in laboratory research, clinical research, and you, Karen, leading the population health research was almost, you know, an, an ideal environment. And, uh, you know, I, I, we were talking before you were with us, I think, between Monash and Darwin and then came back again after Darwin before you went to UniSA. And uh, obviously we've, we've retained that fantastic link ever since. Um, I, I just saw this earlier. You don't get an article on you, written on you in The Lancet unless you're really special. Uh, Simmet has, but, <laughs> but I guess he's pretty special too. <laughs> but, but this isn't about you, Paul. It's about, it's about Karen. And, and Karen is very special. She's very special because she's an outstanding scientist. She's very special because she's uh, an outstanding leader. Uh, she is an absolutely exemplary, as we've heard, in terms of focus on the translation of uh, research findings into clinical practice. And she is very, very special because she is a friend uh, to so many of us, a very important friend, and that's why we're all here today. There's a, I think there's a lovely range of photos. You've seen some of them today. The, the actual, the largest, I, put, I made that one largest because for me that uh, sort of conveyed more emotion to me from Karen than it's uh, tell, telling us the way it is, which Karen does so well. <laughs> so, so Karen, uh, it's, it's been a great honour to be your colleague and your friend. I really uh, appreciated all our interactions. Um, and, and our friendship. Wish you and Bob 
every happiness, success in the next phase of your lives. Thank you. So now I get to uh, introduce the speakers. And next is Bart Curry, um, who's the head of Tropical and Emerging Infectious Diseases uh, at the Menzies School of Health Research. And also brother of John Curry, who uh, was on uh, NHMRC Research Committee with me and Karen, and we shared many lovely dinners uh, <laughs> with your brother John. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> thanks, James. So, so thank, thanks very much for uh, the real privilege and honour of um, speaking on behalf of my, my Menzies colleagues and your many colleagues and friends, Karen. Um, so we called this the, the Menzies years, 2000 to 2005. And um, so up on the left is the Menzies building. Uh, which is called the John Matthews Building, and it's so wonderful, and I certainly acknowledge having John here as the foundation um, professor for the Menzies School of Health Research, the foundation director. Um, and really, John was instrumental until Karen came in everything that happened with Menzies, building it up from what was a couple of rooms in the old nurses' quarters at the back of the hospital, and that's the hospital on the right, the Royal Darwin Hospital. Um, and, and to that building, which is the building that uh, when Karen moved up in 2000 and still is the, the Menzies School of Health Research. And um, uh, Professor Larkins talked about, um, talked about hurricanes, but really they're cyclones. So, but I I'm not sure how, we'd have to have someone think up some wording about, you, you know, the human hurricane is the something or other cyclone, if you can maybe yell it out or... Um, so Darwin is very different from the rest of Australia and we were really, uh, it was really privileged to have Karen there and at the time she came was an ideal time for her to bring her expertise there because in the 15 years before there, uh, under John's leadership, there'd been a lot built up around communicable diseases and um, there was some wonderful epidemiology going on and John had also begun some of the work on chronic diseases, particularly renal disease, and been working on that. But, and Mandy Lee, who's here, which is great to see Mandy, had been doing nutritional work as well, but bring it all together in relation to sort of metabolic syndrome and diabetes was something that really, you know, is the right place for Karen to be at that time. And uh, this is mandatory as well to have, you have to have crocodile pictures when you are. And of course, none of this would phase Karen. Uh, <laughs> And uh, indeed, you'll see there that when President Obama visited Darwin, the present from, uh, the, from the government was crocodile insurance, which is that little thing up on the back there. Uh, that's the crocodile insurance. And you, your family gets $50,000 if you get killed by a crocodile. <laughs> so when, when, uh, Karen, when Karen left, we were thinking of giving her crocodile insurance. And she said, I don't need crocodile insurance, like, you know. Uh, <laughs> The, um, not because she wouldn't be confronting the crocodiles, but the thing is, it was more like the crocodiles wouldn't win, you know. <laughs> um, so over the five years, the, uh, or six years really, that Karen was there, this is just a, a snapshot of the annual reports, and you can all read those. Uh, but um, I'm just going to focus on uh, 2002 as a snapshot of sort of the middle period when Karen was there. And this really talks to the legacy. So this is in the year 2002, uh, some of the things that were happening at Menzies that year. So four students obtained their PhD scholarships, Louise Maple Brown, Julie Brimblecombe, both of whom are talking afterwards, and uh, Emma Cabal, who moved down here to Melbourne, and Matthew Stevens, who's still working in drug and alcohol up in Darwin. So this is 2002, and we're now 2018, and, uh, and Nick Anstey had a his five-year practitioner fellowship then. And Nick still uh, is running what is probably one of the best malaria programs in, in the world out of Darwin. And one of the things is, you know, Karen's, Karen's and my work did not overlap. That much we talked a lot about stuff and I learned a lot from her, but Karen was so supportive of Nick and me in relation to our own interests and, and, and so we're really grateful for that. Um, so what about NHMRC projects and, and fellowships and things? Well, in that one year, 
I'll just read these out because this really has Karen's footprint all over it. And the Druid study, diabetes related disorders in urban indigenous people in the Darwin region. No one had been studying urban, urban indigenous diabetes really until then. Impact, and this carried on from the work that John had uh, begun there, improving indigenous people's access to kidney transplantation, uh, transplantation. The impact of household infrastructure on child health in remote Aboriginal communities. Selective use of antibiotics for chronic obstructive lung disease in Aboriginal adults. Implications of bacterial load for vaccine efficacy and antibiotic treatment in high risk populations. And then molecular epidemiology of melanidosis in Australia, a big issue for the North, and pneumococcal surveillance in the NT. So a selection of, of the traditional sort of more, the things that have been happening there, some of the communicable disease stuff, but then bringing it on this a massively emerging issue, as we've heard from the previous speakers, about chronic disease. And in addition, in 2002, there was renewed FERP funding. So under Karen's leadership, there was a real focus on training the next generation. So uh, the FERP being for the public health, um, FERP, what did FERP say? Public health education. research partnerships. So is that education. program? Education. education research programs, thank you. Development of a course on the social determinants of Indigenous health, a national program on advanced training in public health nutrition, public health workforce development in prevention, early detection, management of chronic diseases in remote rural and Indigenous communities. So this was the, the, the teaching that was uh, going on under her leadership. And then just a couple more things in 2002. The young PhD student, Louise Maple Brown, working on assessment of vascular disease in remote urban Aboriginal populations. <coughs> As a PhD student, she gained three really useful grants from a Diabetes Australia Research Trust Pfizer, Eli Lilly. And, you know, Louise is now the leader of what is a, a nationwide sort of push in uh, diabetes in Indigenous populations out of Darwin. And I'm so pleased you're still there, <laughs> Louise. And uh, Julia, we're really sad you left, but uh, we still think of you as one of us uh, for a couple of months anyway. Um, the, <laughs> And, um, and Nick Anstey, who was an associate professor then, was successful in renewing his NIH malaria funding. So, you know, this is funding coming to Darwin, that little place from NIH. And then our two, uh, our two Menzies Harkness fellows, Russell Gruen, who uh, was a surgeon working on the academic aspects of surgery, and Alan Cass. They left Australia to spend their Harkness year in the US in policy oriented healthcare research. And of course, um, Alan Cass, who is a renal physician, did his PhD under John's supervision, Karen very much worked closely with him and still working um, with Alan, then has now come back to be the current Menzies director. And then the 2002 was the fifth and final year of the CRC in Aboriginal Tropical Health. That was the original one of these bunch of CRCs, a cooperative research centres, which John had started. And uh, this was the fifth and final year in 2002. And Pat Anderson and Pat, you know, has been absolutely central to all this because she was the chair of that CRC and that CRC with various partners around the country was successful in its bid for a new CRC which became the CRC for Aboriginal Health and then subsequent to that the next or the third and then the fourth became uh, the CRC for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Health, all of them with Pat chairing the board and indeed that then became the Lewitch Institute right here in Melbourne uh, which has an absolutely uh, nationwide sort of bringing everyone in around the issue of Indigenous health and Pat is still the chair of that the, uh, today, the Lowitch Institute, which still links in with Menzies but now links in with people all, all over the country. So this is just showing a couple of um, some pictures uh, and this is all related to, uh, to much of the work out at uh, Galawinku and um, in Arnhem Land and uh, this, uh, I think Louis, Louise will recognise this. So there's uh, there's Louise and Julie and some of the other colleagues with Karen out in Galawinku. And so that's back, what year would that have been, you think? 2002. So, and this is, this is a satellite phone and that's, that's Karen because we're all back in Darwin doing the work while Lara's swanning around out in the remote community. <laughs> and that's Karen, and I believe she was making a call back to Darwin to just make sure that everyone was actually turning up to work and doing the right thing <laughs> from the satellite phone. And then it gets worse. Uh, here's, here's, uh, here's Karen checking out some of these spears. Now, 
Not that many of us, because she actually, despite all of her achievements, uh, she's, she's not, you know, like self-promoting in a way that, like, I think I was the only one who knew that she had been, as Richard told us, the javelin champion of Victoria. <laughs> and uh, so when we heard that she was on the satellite phone, <laughs> And this is another picture. You could see that, I don't know how that phone call went, but it seems to me like things back in Darwin, you know, maybe once the leader was no longer there, things were slackening off a bit. And I just want you to, if, I don't know how well you can see that, but that look is quite <laughs> of Karen. And we saw that actually in James, that middle picture, that absolute determination. So we actually, uh, we called that her blue steel look. <laughs> And we were worried that, that those spears may be coming back to Darwin at that time. Um, so I just wanted to, in my brief time, cover that, that snapshot year of 2002, just to show the, the wonderful uh, depth and breadth that you, you brought to Menzies. And we've heard from so many people that that has continued with your links all around in Central Australia, you know, going all the way back to WA. In Queensland, we heard about that as well. And then. And um, there's one message, this is uh, Alan Cass, who's the Director of Menzies School of Health Research now with Karen. And this is last year and it was, you know, it's great. She, when, we, when Karen comes up, we, uh, we see her in the tea room and, and you couldn't miss her with those glasses on, of course. <laughs> and Karen gave a little speech when she came up last year and, and this picture was taken of Alan. But Alan wanted me to just uh, convey the thanks of all of the Menzies staff and all of those here. And, um, and, but to, just to say that I, he's not sure whether the last draft of the fish and fruit paper is with you <laughs> or with him or as Gurmeet here. So there's this fantastic paper about... Uh, uh, Jackie, Jackie's here. It's circulating. It's circulating. <laughs> so there's this wonderful paper that's going to come out about work that was done when Karen was there, fish and fruit, which is uh, giving dialysis patients this fish and fruit diet on the three days a week when they come in, as in a supervised food intervention and there were some very positive findings in the blood but the outcomes from a clinical point of view possibly required more and larger numbers but um, just to finish off all those uh, Northern Territory and Menzies people here could you all just stand up if you're from Menzies or NT just Karen you just or in the past yes or in the past all of you and I just want you to all give her a clap for my, for my. <laughs> so, so thanks very much, Karen. Thanks very much, Bart. Um, next, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Catherine Itziopoulos, who did her PhD with Karen and, and, uh, and with me in the Department of Medicine. Uh, Catherine is now the head of the School of Allied Health at La Trobe. But I'd, the, what I learned from Catherine is the Mediterranean diet is not enough. It has to be the Cretan diet. <laughs> thank you, Jim. Thank you. Uh, it's a great honour to be here. Um, thank you for the invitation to speak. Um, I don't know how much more I can say, but this is uh, now for something different, though. It's a different phase of research. Um, my talk is focused on mentorship because I'm the mentee, the lifelong mentee, started off as a student, the colleague and the friend. Um, so this picture uh, depicts uh, uh, mentoring for me. Successful people um, never reach their goals alone. And many times in the last 24 years that I've known you formally, have I felt like this and I reach out and you always grab my hand. So I formally met Karen in 1994 when I was a, a young acad academic at Deakin and I was very inspired by that talk you gave for the International Olive Oil Council on the Cretan Mediterranean diet because I was a clinical dietitian, I was going to do research in ICU, nothing to do with uh, my background, heritage, had nothing to do with my choice of the Mediterranean diet, it was Karen and that talk. So I left there thinking, wow, this is fantastic. I want to work with this woman. And I was pregnant to Tiana, and I went up shyly and I said, can I do a PhD? And she said, yes, you can. <laughs> so uh, I, uh, this was Friday. Monday, I had to apply for a teaching relief grant. I said, I can't do it. Yes, you can. 
Uh, 48 hours, I think I stayed up. I wrote that grant, I got it. And then we worked solidly together and uh, put in a PHRDC grant for, for the PhD studies and we got it. And that was the beginning of a fantastic career in Mediterranean diet research. Now, the Mediterranean diet uh, has inspired many. It's, it inspired Karen. I think you, you have experienced the lifestyle as well. But I did meet you a few years before with Karen Chisholm, if you recall. She was one of your master's students. And we were at Jim's Tavern. Uh, enjoying a lovely meal and having wine and there was dancing on the tables and cocorezzi. That was a long time ago and you probably did not know me then, but I do remember you because <laughs> you enjoyed <laughs> the Mediterranean, <laughs> the cocorezzi, yes. <laughs> Um, so the journey begins. We started the project called the Greek Migrant Paradox. Low mortality in the presence of multiple CVD risk factors defying the odds. So Greek migrants had been here then about 20 years, now it's 60 years. All of the classical risk factors, including diabetes, but uh, not the uh, premature mortality. So uh, we did an intensive cross-sectional study uh, uh, together with uh, uh, a colleague, Elema Brazionis, who's in the audience. So we worked very closely together. And, uh, and we immersed ourselves in research. So believe it or not, that's me with short, dark brown hair. <laughs> and uh, on the bed, because we had to trial everything, like Karen did in her research, we had to actually do everything, is Mary Kay McCarmus in her designer boots lying on the Dexa bed, <laughs> and I'm trying to measure her sagittal height. <laughs> Um, so what we did to trial the study, we recruited all of the Greek family. They had to come. We did all the tests and Lama put atropine in all, in all of our eyes and we were walking around uh, waiting for, for that to, to pass because she did the fundal photography, of course, for retinopathy screening. Um, so so we, we went on and uh, worked very hard and it was uh, a lot of fun. But what was also a lot of fun when you do research in this area is the uh, travel that you do. And this was a little junket. The International Olive Oil Council in Mallorca doing olive oil tasting. You can see Graham Giles there and Rosemary Stanton. Um, and uh, on the right is uh, my husband and I uh, looking at the ancient olive groves and Sav sends, he sends his thanks that he's accompanied me on, on these junkets. But uh, I, my colleagues are very envious that uh, I do research that takes me to wonderful places around the world. So thank you, Karen. Um, now, this, this photo, thank you for finding this photo, and if uh, those of you in the audience, half of the people in this, in this photo are in this audience, and this is your place, Maggie. It's your place, and so Maggie's right at the front, Maggie Nile, and, uh, and Jane Muir, and uh, Karen Walker in the back, and Lema Brazionis, and uh, so, Connie, you're here too, in the back. Um, so uh, we are all suffering the KOD effect. So I didn't announce that, the Karen O'Day effect, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Research careers in the making, all of us there doing our research careers, and I say in Greek there, even Theano and Anna. Now Theano and Anna are the two uh, uh, older ladies in the back. The Theano is my mother who always likes to be photographed in a profile. And next to her, uh, only that way, uh, very, very proud. And next to her is, is Anna, which is Mary Kamakamas' mother. So they were recruited to do uh, research with us, and I'll explain why, uh, what they did. Now, how did, and uh, most, of, most of the audience here are women, women in research supported by Karen, who's front, front and centre there. How did we do this? Well, Karen uh, looked after the babies while you're off doing research. So another beautiful photo of Karen sitting on, on the couch holding all of our babies. And, um, and, uh, and the, the one right next to you, Karen, with the pink shirt is Tiana, my daughter, the only one that's smiling in the camera. And uh, lately, she's 23 now, and I said, what's it like having a career mum? And she said, well, mum, evidence shows that uh, girls of career mums are more successful in life. And I thought, <laughs> I thought, that's good. All of that time spent away from, from them, but now they see me as a role model. Uh, so I've got my little one there too. So again, thank you, Karen, for influencing our children. Our first RCT, uh, Jim, collaborator here on this and, and co-supervisor, uh, where we reconstructed the Cretan Mediterranean diet and applied it to patients with type 2 diabetes of an Anglo-Celtic background, uh, which was an interesting challenge because um, some of our uh, middle-aged folks said, eggplants, that's for the cows. I've never eaten eggplants. Uh, so foreign foods back, and we are talking about two de decades ago, eating legumes was foreign. But what we did was the authentic 
uh, Cretan Mediterranean diet. So we had Thao Noi and An Anna cooking everything from scratch and that's where uh, they had a wonderful time. But what we did have some challenges because uh, Greek cooks, like any uh, um, proud cook, doesn't want to be interfered with. And when we said you've got to follow the recipes, uh, you can't just add stuff like that. Um, and then they'd say, oh, mas vlepi keren, mas vlepi keren, which means Karen will be watching us if we, <laughs> if, we, if we tamper with the recipes. Now, of course, they were Greek recipes, but they liked to add more salt, and we needed everything controlled. So this was a lovely study. Uh, first RCT I'm aware of in Australia using med diet in type 2 diabetes. We found some great results. A lot of the results were um, things we didn't expect, feeling better, more energetic, skin looks better, people say I look younger, all of these things were interesting, but their diabetes did improve. Uh, we published uh, uh, lots of papers, many of these came after the PhD. Now sometimes things didn't go quite right, and uh, you know, uh, as PhD students, particularly when you're juggling lots of stuff, career and, 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 and family, uh, you think, I can't do this anymore, um, I, 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 I've got to stop. Can't do this, Karen? Yes, you can. And I found that same photo. <laughs> yes, you can. Uh, the, the same photo that Jim was focusing on. So, uh, and Lema and I experienced this together. Yes, you can. So we, we kept going. Um, uh, we, we, we didn't doubt ourselves. Perseverance, uh, resilience, all of those things that you learn. Some years later it happened, got the PhD. Uh, that's a painting, which is, you know, the scary, f uh, big painting in the house. Um, the, the thesis. But I wanted to read this to you, and, and uh, I have shared this with Karen before. I can't believe it took you so many years to prove that the Mediterranean diet was healthy. I could have told you that before you started, if only you'd asked. <laughs> Sav Kutsis, my husband, who's, who's of Greek heritage, but we needed the science. It wasn't just about anecdote or heritage. Uh, through my uh, career, it's been a fabulous career, I've uh, relied on Karen as the KO Day effect, Karen O Day effect, on my shoulder. What's my next move? I'll ask Karen. I'll book a time in the diary. I'll go to Barretto's. So <laughs> for, for a copy, and we can talk through it. And there's a photo of us. Um, and we also meet socially with Lema and Alison uh, regularly as well. But uh, what do you think about this role? What does this CV look like? Uh, what about politics? What about this industry? Um, always uh, reached out for advice and always gave sound advice. And in myself as a mentor, I'd always say, what would Karen do? Um, what would she think of this? <laughs> So, um, and I'm even thinking now, what do you think of this? <laughs> um, celebrating success, translation. So we write papers, uh, as others have said, and that's fantastic. But until we put something out in the public, it, it's not as exciting. And this was really exciting. So the Mediterranean Diet Cookbook, we had a launch, and Karen gave the speech, which was wonderful. Family was there, friends were there. And that's a photo of us um, celebrating that day. So um, lots of anecdotes around the impact um, when, you, when you do a book like this has on, on people that use it in their cooking. Um, and then uh, back to the limelight, went on TV. My daughter thought oh, she's hit the jackpot, now she's famous. Um, I was on with Larry Enda <laughs> and, uh, and cooking tomatoes and talking about the cookbook. And, uh, and then in the end they asked me, what do you think about the paleo diet? What do you think about this? And I thought, oh, better be careful, what would Karen say? <laughs> um, the KOD of D, uh, D effect, contributions to science of the Mediterranean diet in Australia. It started back more than two decades ago. So there's all this um, stuff in the, in, the, in the media and in the scientific literature about the med diet. But we were here in the early 1990s doing work uh, with Karen and Jim and others uh, on the Mediterranean diet. Uh, so uh, we, 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 uh, we put it on the map in Australia, I think, and uh, obviously there are the very big studies like Leon and Predimed that were very, very important. So our work continues. Uh, and Karen continues to be a major influence. And UniSA, again, Healthy Med uh, is, a, is a part of our collaboration as well. Um, this is, uh, uh, someone mentioned preacher, I think you did, <laughs> um, Paul, earlier. Uh, yes, uh, Karen's a preacher. I've become a preacher too, because we've got 10 commandments of the Mediterranean diet. Uh, but basically, they're, they're, they're um, tips, tools to, to use to implement this uh, dietary model in any cuisine any cuisine, so, um, and this is a plate model. So plant-based diet, four to one plant to animal food ratio, this is what it would look like. Tinsy bit of meat, lots and lots of uh, vegetable matter. Um, the mentee becomes a mentor. I now have my um, 
uh, group of, of PhDs, uh, and uh, a number of them have graduated already, which is fantastic. And uh, and I um, uh, aim to be the mentor that that Karen is and has been to me. Enabling success. These are your PhD students. There's a lot of your postdocs here as well. I just thought I'd run through some of. Uh, some of the successes. Managing Director, International Biotech Company. Uh, Chair, NHMRC, Australian Dietary Guidelines Committee. Uh, Professor of Nutrition and Food Science. Professor of Nutrition. Pro Vice Chancellor Research. Associate Dean International. Uh, Director TeamsNet. Chair and uh, Professor of Aboriginal Health. Head of School of Allied Health. Professor of Dietetics. And Fellow of the Royal College of uh, Pathologists in Australia. Just to name a few. Uh, of the successes of your PhD students. So I just want to finish with uh, this note. Karen, you are my lifelong mentor who inspired me to follow a Mediterranean diet research career following your Inspiration I seminar in 1994 where you passionately described the health promoting effects of the Cretan diet. Your advice, guidance, patience, perseverance and belief in me has been my driving force in research and career choices and I will always be indebted to you. I aspire to be the mentor to others that you have been and are to me. Congratulations. Thank you very much, Catherine. Now, uh, our next speaker is Elaine Maypalama. And uh, Elaine, I, I, I believe that sh that's your research name and you also go um, by the name of Lawerpa? Larapa, sorry, Larapa. Uh, and uh, your um, research is on Elko Island, to which you're connected through your father's father. So it's an honour to have you here. Thank you. You. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Laura Pametrama, originally from Kalawinko, but I'm living in Darwin through my work. Um, I acknowledge and give my respect for Wurundjeri people of this country, which, uh, which I'm standing on. My next one. Um, I'm a Yolngu person. I would like to speak on my own language. Uh, as you can see on the screen there, you have to read it in English, but I have to talk in language because that's my... English is not my first language. It's my fifth or sixth or tenth language, but bear with me. Thank you. Karina, Kanina, a role model. Morok. Healthy ngatapui ka activity mala ka napur ngoni mritin mara ngamatin ngori ki jamau pelinguni nakon ngai dukar mir kongar ngori ki ka jama walar ngoni jamai ka napur yang ngoni mritin kong mirin beli ngai ngoni ki jama Muriki study on Nakun. Come written up in Wal Munele, Jamal Kaljaming a monk young ring a diabetes to Paranyanakun Wakal, hip hop or Kangal kan, Jamarkulin, children now in the after school, Kabulunakun healthy lifestyle. My ring in Nakun study monk to Kabulunakun storytelling. Every afternoon we give out cards or invitation to bring them to Nawi. Um, 
invite them to come to the healthy life now we test wala na kun hip hop wala kan bul ira style na uni wala na kun bungol jama after now we will not kun that's a lifestyle of dancing ma cooking class every afternoon cooking na alpa used to run cooking class storyboard telling thou <coughs> tell thou at the area where you all know nina ka na manga mabutoro bitun thou diabetes boy bolo ja mangata palawanga lel tuali mala activity nguninga ikan diabetes now we study on gunal Tuana home garden na introducing Aiken to the community because of moving his study when he carried the making establishing a feet put her feet on the ground by stand and talk and told the Yolmo people out there. Unangata na pungal walkan introducing. Yo, Karen don't want to planting seed. She planted the seed only to be able to under, make understand you all more people out there to be healthy and to get the message across. I don't America. That you all want to help mind. That you all want heart. Ni kadua di lakam, ay to marci nya malam dua di journey, no malang dukar, life, limurong, ma. Ka it is hope nungo, ka nungo vision, nungo dream nuni, to continue nuni journey, to be naprongal, una jenaga. We will. Keep nungo, nungo, ngayang umurkur na we di pahat. Kang ayang ulil, whoever nungo. Ma, thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. It's it's hard to think of a more meaningful endorsement of Karen's Im impact uh, within, within this country. So next is Julie Brimbleken, who's Associate Professor at Charles Darwin University, Senior Researcher at Menzies School of Health Research, where she is a Nutrition Team Leader in Wellbeing and Preventable Chronic Disease. Thanks, Julie. <laughs> So as Bart said, very sadly, I've um, just finished up with the Menzies School of Health Research and come down to Monash. But um, Karen, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to um, talk today and just say a big thank you for the inspirational journey that um, you've really provided for me to be able to go on. So um, I've called this Exploring New Frontiers because that's how I really see Karen and I think that's how everybody has really described her today as well. And um, last Saturday I thought, you know, I really want to go and visit Karen because she's such an engaging storyteller. She is just such a fantastic communicator. And, um, you know, I've seen Karen in action in so many different places and like people have talked about today, you know, she, she can communicate from so many different levels. And, you know, I, sp I certainly spent a lot of my time with Karen at Gallowinkle community and in the homelands. And Karen would um, just engage people and people would really want to hear more about um, the type of information that the, the story that they, people believe that she, she had for them. And so I went and visited Karen and I was really, I like to hear the stories over and over again. I think that's the, the art of a really good storyteller as well, because um, if you think about Aboriginal oral history, you know, people remember because they hear these stories. And so um, I visited Karen and she told me more about, you know, the, the journey in 1982 when she took people out onto country. And, um, 
And I saw this photo here. And that is you, Karen, isn't it? No? no okay. I, I took it. Okay, Karen took that photo. But I thought it certainly demonstrated the determination and the fascination and the curiosity um, that Karen embraces everything with. And um, so the story that Karen said to me was when they're out on ca um, country, there were yams apparently everywhere. But they were really difficult to find these yams because the cattle over many years had tramped on the tendrils and the roots that you try to find to be able to find those yams. So I did think that that was Karen um, being very determined trying to find yams. And when I showed the picture to Lodapa, she did say, well, we do it quite differently in the top end. So. <laughs> um, um, and I was thinking, you know, who else would go and live off country for seven weeks with Aboriginal people, you know, learning from them, um, being, a, being a true scientist and really trying to understand um, what was happening with regards to type 2 diabetes at that time. And the person that came to my mind was Donald Thompson. So he was a graduate, he was an anthropologist, a zoologist, a graduate from uh, University of Melbourne. Maybe some of you have heard of him recently with the, the film, The Ten Canoes, where the director was um, Rolf de Heer. And um, in that film, they show these beautiful images from Remingidin community. So um, he was at University of Melbourne. He was really concerned about the plight of Aboriginal people up in northeast Arnhem Land, where there had been some killings up there of some Japanese men, I think, that were actually meddling with probably the women of some Aboriginal men there. And so um, there was going to be this punitive ex expedition. People from Darwin were going to go across and um, go to Blue Mud Bay and certainly cause a lot of strife there. So um, Donald Thompson, being um, an advocate for Indigenous people at that time, got support from the Commonwealth and went up and made peaceful relationships with the people up there. And um, so he was a scientist, he was an investigator, he was, um, he was somebody who really advocated for Indigenous, a, a better understanding in white society of Indigenous people. And I think um, this certainly um, is, is what Karen is, um, has been over many years and still is today. Um, so I think we've seen this picture a few times today, but um, uh, there's Karen somewhere in the truck or maybe driving along in the bus, but going out onto country where, you know, she was expecting that she might be out there for three months. Um, there was no plan on where they were, they were going to go. And so, you know, that determination um, and adventurous spirit was certainly there. Um, as uh, Tom talked a lot about, you know, Karen, they're on country. And I just tried to imagine what that would be like doing the same type of thing, you know, for seven weeks, sleeping on a sway. Karen didn't have a tent um, under the stars in the open air. No coffee, no tea, none of those kinds of luxuries, not even a warm shower, um, and learning a lot from, from people there, but also, you know, sharing the expertise that she had with them as well. Um, so, you know, Karen's fascination of traditional foods, I think I've certainly learned so much from Karen and, and I think share probably the same kind of fascination. And, you know, Karen told stories about how she really loved a duck when she was out on country. And so when that was, um, when that was hunted and caught, um, Karen really enjoyed that. But Karen has got so much information about from the time of observing people for those seven weeks. You know, these hunters here, for example, she describes that the, the hunters would get the mesenteric fat and the head and the shoulders of the kangaroo would go to the hunter and then other people would um, enjoy the other parts. Karen apparently loved the liver, um, particularly when it was fresh and, and put on the fire. Um, it, was a, it was a real delicacy and um, and so, you know, Karen has contributed so much to the understanding of traditional food and being a real advocate for how important that is um, for people's health. Uh, her dedication to science, I think, certainly um, was demonstrated in that study she did where, like, I think Karen was um, just like Michael Mosley. She was um, her own human subject. And not only did she weigh everybody in those seven weeks and probably weighed them very, very regularly, um, but did the same for herself. And, uh, you know, did other experiments such as um, investigating her blood clotting time. So, you know, such um, dedication to science. And, and I think people have talked a lot about um, 
the, re the translation of research and science into practice and disseminating that with everybody. And, you know, this study was so important at the time that Karen wanted to share it with the world through publishing um, in the Diabetes, yeah, Diabetes Journal. Um, Karen was such an advocate for um, Indigenous health and trying to improve Indigenous health. And uh, she told a story that when she was in the Kimberleys, and this just shows that she had such a reputation and such a high regard um, from people in the communities that when she was there, this group of women here, they actually travelled quite a way, came across the river to actually speak with her because they wanted to talk to her about how important um, Aboriginal foods were and, um, you know, to be able to share those kinds of stories with her. And so, you know, Karen has certainly been that advocate for Indigenous health and particularly for nutrition. And so um, exploring new frontiers, you know, the next era of research started in community-based intervention studies. And this is when, you know, we had the Luma study that we've um, heard about, Mandy Lee with the um, Minjalang study, the studies in Hermansburg. And these were really at the forefront of really trying to understand prevention of diabetes and heart disease at a time when there really wasn't very much evidence. There wasn't very much theory about how to how to um, manage these kinds of studies or how to <clears throat> design these kinds of studies. But these types of studies really resonated with people in the community because they, they really captured Aboriginal, view, Aboriginal um, perspectives of health, you know, looking at health from a very holistic position and um, very much working in partnership with the community and um, listening to people and really seeing the community as leaders and having an understanding and being able to drive change for their own health. Um, and so Karen um, came up to Menzies in 2000 as the director, as um, Bart talked about. And so um, the hurricane or the cyclone that people have referred to came out to Gallowinkle community. And like Lotta has said, we started a community-based intervention study there as well. And um, so I remember the first meeting that we had with people in the community. Um, Karen was there and people knew that Karen was there and that she had a story to share with that community. And about 30 people came along to the health centre to hear about the study that Karen had to offer people. And as Lotta has said, you know, we didn't know what that study was about. We didn't know what was going to happen. But when we heard um, the story from Karen, what she had done with the Moanjum people taking them out onto country and with the study at Luma, you know, there was that real hope that um, working with Karen would really help to um, improve health in the community. This was also another change that was happening at that time was really about um, working with the community rather than the community being participants in research. And I think, you know, this work really transformed the way that, um, you know, certainly us researchers in Menzies approached the research that we did. We put a lot of emphasis on capacity building. And this is, you know, the work that Karen really led and really supported so that it wasn't um, just the researchers going out and collecting samples and doing surveys and that type of thing, but it was very much about, you know, working closely with Aboriginal health practitioners, training up people in the community um, to be able to do these screenings together with people in the community. And then what Karen was saying was that um, the knowledge is in the community, you know, the know-how is in the community. If we need to prevent diabetes, yes, certainly we need funding and we need government support to be able to do that. But there's knowledge here that can be harnessed and there's um, ways of knowing that can be used to try to do activities in the community to support people to be able to eat healthier food and do more physical activity. And um, so over three years, we actually documented all those different activities, health promoting activities that happen in the community in all the different sectors, you know, at the school, at the store, at the council, at the health centre, in all the different sectors. And there were 215 health promoting activities that were actually led and driven by the community over that time. And I think that this really demonstrates 
the amount of energy that there is in communities, the amount of hope and the amount of know-how and capacity that with the right kind of support, like Karen was able to provide, that um, people can really mobilise to try to take action to prevent diabetes. Unfortunately, though, um, you know, these types of programs, um, they happen for a number of years everybody gets really um, involved and then it's just we're still advocating and Karen's still advocating you know to try to get that support um, to be able to keep keep this kind of um, momentum happening in communities so just like um, Karen did in 1982 Gullawinkle community wasn't enough we had to go out onto the homelands and really work with people in the homelands to be able to demonstrate how important it is for people to be able to live on their country um, in order for them to have better health. And so this took us out to a number of communities in North East Arnhem Land, and this is um, Karen here with Doris Sieton in Matamata community, which is Lodipa's mother's country. Um, and so this, you know, this was a great adventure for us, um, just like Karen did in 1972. You know, there certainly wasn't going to be too many comforts. We had the swag, um, and I must say in Gullawinkle, you know, Karen was very strict about, you know, we must walk everywhere. Um, certainly, certainly, we can't use money to get a to get a car because we we need to be role models in the community. And so um, this is us in in one of the communities going from the airstrip um, to the community. There wasn't really a car that we. Could use. There was a wheelbarrow, but unfortunately the wheelbarrow had a flat tyre. So that's um, myself and Toma and one of the um, women from Gullawinkle community that was working with us. So, um, you know, Karen um, supported all of this work in Gullawinkle and the homelands um, and really had such a high regard um, from the people in Gullawinkle community and really um, transformed the way that we, we did research with communities. Um, but then she mentored, and you know, I think a lot of people have talked about this, the next wave of researchers. So I just want to run through um, a number of these researchers quickly. So through that work at Gullawinkle Community, um, Jackie Boyle, she did her PhD on polycystic ovary syndrome. Um, there you can see Emma Caval. Uh, she also did her PhD through that work at Gullawinkle on the stigma of white privilege. Um, myself, so you know, a lot of work around looking at the social injustice of food and nutrition for Aboriginal people. Uh, Louise Maple Brown, um, doing you know, as Bart said, setting up a whole program around diabetes and renal disease. Uh, Toma Shemesh, who's here down the back here, um, also did his PhD, um, which was related to the work at Gullawinkle. And um, you know, not only was Karen a great mentor, but she also encouraged us. Um, to work closely with people in the community. And so a lot of her, who, who um, as you know, just presented, um, supported all of us and supervised most of us and then was awarded um, and recognised for that work through achieving an do honorary doctorate through CDU. And so then um, Karen continues to inspire the next generation of researchers and um, including Dr Jackie Hughes and Megan Ferguson. So Karen, um, thank you for the journey that I've been able to have with you. I never, um, never imagined that I would uh, be an academic and be on that research pathway. But certainly when I came back from years in the Solomons and saw a position advertised at Menzies when you started as director there, and I'd been very much inspired by your, your work before that, and saw that the position was uh, to develop, implement and evaluate a community-based intervention study to redu reduce the risk of diabetes and heart disease. I went, when do you get the opportunity to develop something, implement it and evaluate it? And wouldn't it be a, just a wonderful opportunity to be able to work with you? So um, thank you, Karen. Um, you just continue to inspire me. And I must say, Catherine, the same thing. I always go, what would Karen be doing now? What would Karen be thinking? So thank you very much. Thanks very much, Julia. Sorry I missed your recent move to Monash. Uh, this problem with being out of the country for the past three years. <laughs> um, so next, to uh, uh, Louise Maple Brown, who uh, we heard did her PhD with Karen. And now, are you still at the Menzies? I am. Oh, very good, very good. <laughs> uh, head of 
Department of Endocrinology at Royal Darwin Hospital and uh, NHMRC Practitioner Fellow. Thank you. Very good, Louise. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, so to me, Karen has been the most wonderful leader, role model and mentor, and I'm gonna talk about uh, that today. So to me, Karen is absolutely a leader by example. And these photos are from her time as director at Menzies when I first met Karen was in 2002, uh, when she was the director of Menzies and uh, I moved to Darwin to do my PhD, supervised by Karen. I'd actually never been to Darwin and I've actually never met Karen <laughs> before I moved to do my PhD. It was thanks to Don Chisholm actually that. That was. Um, so Karen, yeah, always absolutely a passionate advocate, com completely committed, completely inspiring to all of, all of us and always has so much energy and enthusiasm, and enthusiasm. So to me, that is leadership by example. Also, as Julie and others have said and Larrup de demonstrated beautifully, uh, Karen always has very strong partnerships with communities with her work. And the first uh, community-based project that I was involved in with Karen was the Gallowin Q Healthy Lifestyle Project. Uh, and we had very, very strong uh, partnership with the community there. And that was all thanks to Karen uh, and her wonderful work there. For me, within two weeks of arriving in Darwin, Karen had me out in Galawinku uh, for cultural training by immersion, uh, thanks to Larifa, uh, who adopted me. Larifa's my nandi, my mother. Um, and uh, I was lucky enough to have fantastic cultural training from all the women out there. Uh, and uh, there's Larifa with her grandchildren, Yunginninga down there with Julie but also all our team, many of who are here today, Joe Fitz at the back in that photo, uh, Toma and Julie and Dorothy McCarris, I don't know if Dorothy's here, um, but that was actually celebrating my 30th birthday within my first week in Gallowinku as well. So. <laughs> um, yeah, and uh, to me this just demonstrates the success behind Karen's work really is her, uh, her meaningful relationships with people in community and the truly collaborative nature of that work uh, through such strong partnerships with such incredibly mutual uh, respect as has been uh, mentioned by others. And my greatest memory is uh, similar to Bart and Julie's photos um, was our trip uh, to remote outstations in northeast Arnhem Land. Uh, Karen, Julie and I uh, went um, and uh, Karen was the director of Menzies at the time but was out bush for a week and I'm pretty sure she was out of communication but <laughs> um, and Karen absolutely loved it. You can see that aspect of Karen where she absolutely loves the bush uh, and loves being out bush as, as do we all. Uh, and it was a fantastic experience. Karen was determined to be actively involved. She was not gonna be the boss sitting around. She took all the blood from all the participants and she processed it all in the remote bush lab. She hadn't done blood taking for a little while, <laughs> but she did it all. Um, I was doing the vascular ultrasounds. Uh, Julie was probably doing all the anthropometry and questionnaires, I think, but Karen was in there up, up to her elbows and absolutely leading by example there. Uh, we did have some beautiful bush tucker as well, thanks to Karen. And uh, yes, I'm pretty sure that phone was not in action <laughs> that Karen was trying to use. Technology was not quite the same as it is these days, 15 years ago. Um, so another great thing I've learned from Karen that she absolutely always does is, as everyone said, she's a very visionary and very strategic thinker. She always sees the big picture, but also Karen sees the detail. Uh, for me as her PhD student and for many others in the room uh, when she was our PhD supervisor, she always, she loves the data, uh, always sees the data from all different angles and really does get into the detail. I've also learnt uh, from Karen about the importance of just being practical and being pragmatic and being flexible and being able to adapt and change and including when things don't go to plan. Uh, the Druid study, we changed, no, Karen and, and Joan and others changed the study design and that, that's important to just be able to do that and, and adapt and be flexible. So Karen was a fantastic support for me in my early career and for many others as well. And another thing that Karen really has um, 
taught me is about setting priorities. Importantly, when to say yes, but also most importantly, when to say no. So Karen has, has taught me a lot about that, and I always ask Karen whether I should be saying yes or no to opportunities. And I similarly try and pass on uh, this to other people who I now mentor as early career researchers. Karen has supported me and, and others uh, in developing a clinical research program that's continued since she's left Menzies. Uh, and there are some of the studies there that uh, we've all been involved in, in diabetes and related conditions, uh, led from several of us at Menzies, including Joan Cunningham, who's here, and Liz Barr, who's also here uh, somewhere. So just um, these photos are from the EGFR study. So the EGFR study involves 600 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people across Northern Territory, Far North Queensland and Western Australia from all different communities and health services that we've been working with in those regions. The first stage of the study was to validate the test, the EGFR test of kidney function in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. Then the second stage was looking at progression, the risk factors for progression of kidney disease. And then now the third stage is being led by Jackie Hughes. Where are you, Jackie? <laughs> Jackie's up there. Jackie was a PhD student at the beginning of the EGFR study. She's now leading the first third phase of the study. Jackie's an NHMRC Early Career Fellow and she's also Australia's first Indigenous nephrologist. Uh, so she's based at Menzies in Darwin and is now leading uh, the next phase of the EGFR study. This is our Diabetes in Pregnancy program of work that Karen has absolutely been the most passionate support of, supporter of right from the beginning. Um, PANDORA, it stands for Pregnancy and Neonatal Diabetes Outcomes in Remote Australia, and that acronym is thanks to Alex Brown. Where's Alex? Oh, up there. <laughs> thank, thank you, Alex. Um, and yeah, Karen has supported this work right from the beginning, including some early funding, uh, thanks to Karen, to get it going. Uh, PANDORA is a longitudinal birth cohort study involving 1,100 women and their babies, uh, the oldest of whom are now uh, six years old. Uh, and speaking of the importance of women, Karen, uh, as others have mentioned, has been an incredible role, mo role model as a woman uh, and very inspiring to me and many others. I now lead a team of 20 all women, <laughs> postdocs, PhD students, researchers, they're all women. Um, so thank you, Karen, for that. Karen also helped me with my life beyond work. <laughs> Thanks to Karen, I actually found my lifelong partner and now husband, um, Simon. We met in Galawinku. Um, uh, apparently, Thursday night is singles night in Alper supermarket in Galawinku, if anyone's interested. <laughs> This was a couple of years later when, uh, thank you to Larifa, organised a special wedding bungle for us on, uh, on Galawinku. Even more wonderful thanks to Karen is that Simon is at home looking after our children while I'm able to, <laughs> while I'm able to come here and talk and, and pursue my career. So thank you, Karen, for that. I wouldn't be in, Bar in Darwin, but still, I don't think if Karen hadn't found Simon for me, so. <laughs> well, you never know. Um, and the, I'm in the sunglasses there, everyone. Um, this is also thanks to Larapa, some, uh, some wonderful experiences I've been privileged to be part of in Galawinku. Um, but this really reflects for me the holistic worldview of Karen uh, and that framework that I have learned, uh, learned from Karen and from, from all the Yungul and Galawinku and other Aboriginal communities as well. And that's an incredibly important uh, reframing of our worldview and uh, and very important le lessons for me. So just to finish, to me, the two versions of Karen, the absolutely inspiring and passionate advocate and leader, and then the Karen who loves being out bush and working so closely with Aboriginal communities in true respectful <laughs> partnerships. Thank you, Karen. <laughs> Thank you, Louise. Now, in, in the program, uh, there's now another opportunity for anyone who wasn't uh, able to um, present to uh, say a few words or um, ask, Karen a, ask, <laughs> no, ask Karen a question. Not really. Anyone want to make, make any statements? Paul. You mentioned that hair-raising flight. Hmm. Karen, I understand there is, and I meant to mention that you were on a flight to the team recently, and the door of the plane 
These are the risks of being yeah. a field survey. Yes, yeah, so I've almost forgotten about that, but you know, what were you reminding me of? It? Um, we managed to, to turn around and land safely, but, but clearly one of the motors had stopped. And um, I was sitting behind the, the pilot, and I was at a window, and I saw one of the engines smoking. So that was pretty scary. And I, and, uh, and I poked the down and he said, I've seen it. <laughs> so, so we just turned around and came back and um, everybody was very relieved that we all got off the safe. And then we got another flight. We, we didn't, didn't stop us going to the Tiwi Islands. We got another plane. And I remember waiting. I, I get mos bitten by mosquitoes. And I had, we had to stand on the runway and wait for this next plane to come. And I just got covered in mosquito bites. That's my other strongest memory of it. <laughs> but uh, yes, it was pretty scary. But that's about the only time that's ever happened, fortunately. Very good. Anyone else want to share a story? I, I, I did have one because I, I remember once, I, I think we were traveling interstate and I'd just come back from the US and unknown to me, my wife had put a fruit knife into my, into my <laughs> briefcase. <laughs> and so I got stopped at the airport and it was all very embarrassing. And Karen said, oh, don't worry. When I came back from I don't, uh, a field trip, had, had, you know, one of those you call that a knife. This is a knife <laughs> covered in blood now in, in her. <laughs> Just give it to us and get it at the other end. <laughs> mm. Okay, now to wrap things up, we have the great pleasure of hearing from Alex Brown, um, who who needs no introduction. No. So I won't actually. Fair Thank enough. you, Alex. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for the chance to say a few words here. I, I'm actually quite an ignoramus. I, I didn't really know uh, what a first shrift was. So I had a look on Google and it said it was something about a bound volume of scientific papers to reflect on the life and times of a, of a scientist. Um, I clearly thought that that wasn't what we were doing today. So I went to the thesaurus. Look through that. Uh, one was from the Urban Dictionary, which said um, the transit time of your gut after eating a hot dog you get at 3 a.m. <laughs> I thought that wasn't quite relevant either. And then the next one was it was a roast. Um, so I've developed all of these slides to stop this incessant sycophantry about saying how wonderful Karen O'Day is. <laughs> because I'm up to here with it. It's been all day. Everyone talking about how wonderful Karen is. So I've looked hard and wide for as much dirt as I could find on Karen to, to throw you out uh, in, in, into the West, as people have been talking about. Um, I pass on a couple of uh, good wishes. Nairi couldn't be here today, Karen. She is a great fan of yours and always has been. She was stuck in Canberra dealing with um, politicians, which you and I know is one of the most painful experiences in our working life. And I'd also like to mention somebody who wasn't able to, to be here with us and has been touched on and mentioned a couple of times, our great friend Kev. It's good to see you here, Maz. I've missed you, but no near as much as I've missed our mate. And so in true Kev fashion, I thought, well, if I was here interviewing Kev and I got to ask him, Kev, what do you think about Karen? Kev would say, uh, um, she's Bonza. <laughs> and I couldn't say it better myself. So how did I first meet Karen? Uh, it was actually similar to um, what Sandra talked about uh, before. It was a lecture at the University of Newcastle. Interestingly enough, Sandra Eads was one of the reasons I was able to get into medicine. Her and, uh, and, uh, and Rob Sanson Fisher interviewed me to get into medicine uh, back in, I think it was 1989. In 1990, I was at a lecture 
in medicine that Karen O'Day gave about her classic study, which has been talked and talked about uh, a lot today. And um, I, it really didn't do anything for me at that stage, Karen. I'm really sorry. But I've subsequently <laughs> gone back and gotten a copy of those slides and I've played them backwards very quickly. And there's a message in there. It sounds like Charles Manson. It's saying, eat more fruit and veg. <laughs> so you obviously affected my life. And you can see that in this slide, of course. Um, you can see that in this slide here. These are photos of me, believe it or not. The first one, right next to Karen, uh, is from 1990. Uh, and that was just after my days as a Mexican, Mexican drug runner. <laughs> uh, but I moved on. I used this second photo to show you that I've had the man bun for 20 plus years. It's not a new trend. I've been all over it for years. It's just come around again. And the second is there's a small object in my hand, which you can't see very well but it is in fact an apple. Now, many of you would know I'm not a friend of fruit and vegetables, but Karen had obviously changed my life and I had a, my last photo in med school with a piece of fruit. It was a miracle. Thank you, Karen. So, where was the next time that Karen and I came into contact? Well, the first one was at a, a CRC uh, meeting in Darwin about um, yarning and research in Aboriginal communities. And I remember at that meeting I had a fight with Karen, a very public disagreement about truth and rigour. And the argument was fundamentally that I believe there was really only one truth and that was mathematics. And the second part is that everything else is up to conjecture. And there's ways of viewing truth from many perspectives. Karen didn't like that. And so when I spoke to her a little while later and was offered a job to set up the unit of Menzies in Alice Springs, I was lost for words. And that's because people had said to me after, oh my God, you just had an argument with Karen. I said, oh, oh that's okay, isn't it? I think she was up for it. <laughs> she clearly was. Um, but I was lost for words. And this is important because many of you who would know me know that I'm never lost for words, but there have been three occasions. This was the first, uh, sorry, no, this was the third. The first one when, when, was when I was trying to work out uh, how to ask my then girlfriend whether we could have sex. I think I tried the, uh, uh, how about it? That's about as good as I got. And the next time I was silent was, as I've pictured here, 98 seconds later. <laughs> Where has Karen set me on my path? <laughs> so the other pictures didn't come through, so I'm not sure. <laughs> it was a much better joke when I told it to myself in my head. <laughs> so, so what path has Karen set me and the people that work with me on? It's really fundamentally on this, this path of understanding and overcoming chronic disease in disadvantaged communities. And there's a lot to be said about what Karen's taught me and many, many others in this space. She's also taught me to challenge the assumptions, to debunk the stupidity that frames the way in which the policy of the time tries to understand how to overcome disadvantage, inequality and Aboriginal communities. And it's been uh, no doubt a lifelong frustration, but also commitment that Karen's had and she's instilled in many, many people around this country. The other assumption is that there's no evidence out there to guide <laughs> what you should do in overcoming inequalities in Aboriginal health. There's plenty of evidence, perhaps you knuckleheads should read it. But similarly, it's also <laughs> reminded me that our modern political system is actually more aligned to the Muppets than it is to anything else. And you can see here the striking resemblance of some of our politicians to the uh, luminaries of entertainment from the uh, 80s and 90s, which I grew up on. Speaking of time frames, I'm very glad to say, Tom, that uh, you were born on the time of that classic study. I was born the year of Karen's PhD, so there's some sense of ro ro um, coming back to full circle here. The other thing that really has been imprinted on me and the work that we do is trying to understand lifestyle and context. It's very easy to talk to people about what they should do and what they should eat. But I think as in many ways, even the, the career of Julie would suggest is if people can't afford the food that you tell them to eat, what in God's name are you going to do about it? And we need to understand chronic disease and risk from a broader perspective than the things that they don't do when we tell them. And how do we understand where Aboriginal people have come from in this cycle of change and the impact of colonisation and how this has 
uh, basically uh, writ large on the, the livelihoods, the wellness and the health of our communities. So understanding lifestyle and context is extremely important. And this is in stark contrast to the sorts of policies that we develop in Australia for chronic disease. Tony Abbott will say, well, Aboriginal people, if they want to be healthy, eat better. And importantly, and this is now a very important part of the Trump agenda, you say something stupid and then you get people to come in and explain what your stupid statements were actually about. Tony sent somebody out to say, well, which is actually much worse than his original statement, uh, the point is everyone can go out and buy a pair of sneakers. Thank you. That's a great policy agenda for Australia and for Aboriginal health. Thanks very much. The other thing we've learned is the importance of understanding, and I think Paul touched in, on this right at the start of the day, overcoming intergenerational disadvantage. Now we could, and I've sat around this table and we've thought about some of these policy uh, responses, and we've said them in hushed tones, uh, usually after a couple of drinks, but there is significant stupidity in the political cycle of Aboriginal affairs in this country and it has been for a long time and I'm worried it's going to continue. And thankfully we've all got uh, uh, steel um, girdles to protect us from the stupidity of Australian political life, thanks to Karen. We've also learnt that it is in fact possible to measure the unmeasurable. This is some work that we did in Central Australia around understanding the links between the heart and mind of Aboriginal men, to understand depression in its socio-cultural context and what impact that had on health. And when we started down this journey, I said to Karen, I don't know how to do this. Uh, this is what the community has demanded that I do. She said, don't worry, no one really does. Get out there and get done. And the way we started, ask the, ask the experts. Where do we start? We started with the community, with what they already knew. And this was fundamentally a part of Kieran's agenda in all the work that we did, which is where is the community at? What do they know? How can we build on that? And the journey we've now entered down is trying to understand this interrelationship of chronic conditions in Aboriginal people and what drives them all together. The atherosclerosis story, the insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, diabetes story, the chronic kidney disease story, and you've heard parts of this story from many people all day. And we're very interested in what's at this interface. And Karen has played an enormous hand for many people around this country and further afield about starting to unpack these complex interrelationships. And I'm very proud to be a part of that family. So, um, despite the fact that I was trying to get a whole bunch of dirt on Karen. Uh, I did speak to all of the marketeers at uh, Queen Vic Markets and they said, look, do not leave that woman uh, alone here for too long. No capsicum is safe, <laughs> as can be seen from here. Uh, what, I, what, I th what I thought I'd talk about are the things that Karen taught me and the people that I work with. Firstly, everyone's talked about her glasses. Stop picking on Karen's glasses. The reason is, if you're that good, you can wear whatever the hell you like. <laughs> so shut up, all of you. I won't have any more of it. Talent defines how outrageous your glasses can be. You can go harder, Karen. <laughs> the second bit is, never be afraid to name it. Racism exists in this country. It influences the lives and times of Aboriginal communities and other ethnic minority groups today as it has for hundreds of years in this country, stand up and name it and be proud to. I've also learnt the 80% rule. If you've got 10 really smart people around a table and you can convince eight of them to do something, you're on a winner. Now you will see that this is actually looks like a photo from Dinner with Schmucks. It's actually one of the NIHEC meetings that Karen and I were involved in many years ago. The trouble was finding 10 talented bureaucrats and senior politicians to get around a table, but we did our best. Thank you, Karen, the 80% rule. Don't forget it. The next one, be sure to challenge assumptions, especially your own. This is really important as scientists. This is really important as humanitarians. We think we know a lot of things about certain things. Sometimes we're going to be right, but more times than not, we're going to be wrong, and that's OK. Karen has this tremendous capacity to see the best in everyone. I do not have this quality. I'm sorry, Karen, I'm working on it, but I'm not there yet. 
I do notice that Stephen Hawking has stolen your mantra here about seeing the wonder in the world. Kieran was onto it long before him. He's just a Johnny come lately, really. But fundamentally, Kieran has the capacity to see the wonder in everything and everyone, even the people who are tearing shreds off other people because they've got something good to offer all of us, even in the most difficult of times. I remember ringing Kieran a couple of times and saying, I've just been in a meeting with a whole bunch of Aboriginal politicians from communities. They've called me all sorts of names. My God, what am I going to do? And she said, well, they're very passionate about their community, aren't they, Alex? And I said, yes, Karen. <laughs> they were. The other thing is, you'll notice, Karen speaks with her hands when she's excited. So she'll give you a paper. Alex, you've got to read this. It's fascinating. It always is fascinating. Say, so, Alex, you've got to read this thing from Louise Maple Brown. It's brilliant. And you could always tell where, whether her hands turned in or out with how excited she was about something. So when it came in, it was, yes, the best thing ever. Karen, thanks for your wonder of wonder itself. The other thing I've learned from Karen is be resolute but not stubborn. There's an important difference. The important difference is to always be flexible in the face of adversity and always know that you might be wrong. Be resolute about where you want to get to, but never be stubborn about how you might go there or what you do understand about the world before you. Be courageous. And I think people have talked about Karen's courage and bravery all day. I don't think it's overblown. What I've learned is be courageous in all that you do. And it's about standing up for what's right, even when the road ahead is the most treacherous and difficult. And that's really the test of you as a person, of you as a scientist, of you as a humanitarian. And the right path, particularly in Aboriginal health, is rarely the easiest. Persevere. Never give up on yourself, and especially in the face of adversity, because your integrity depends on it. Duty. Where injustice lives, duty calls, and it's never somebody else's job. It's yours. Get up, shut up, make a difference. And finally, the 10 things that Karen O'Day showed me, pursue greatness, but do it with humility. Greatness is not about all the things that you know, no matter how good all the things that you know may be. In the case of Karen, that is tremendous. But it's about the larger change. It's about the people that you inform, that you care for along the way. So please join me in thanking and acknowledging a great scientist, a great mentor, a great friend, uh, and a great human, Karen. It's been a wild ride. <laughs> uh, once more, it's Karen O'Day. <laughs>